I have, I'll start with this mic and then we'll switch over. Yeah. Um, I'm, maybe this is a question for Jeff. Um, I'm thinking about power in argumentation and reasoning. I mean, your example of what restaurant to go to, and obviously there's a whole um, issue of the relationship context and whose turn is it to choose and whose priorities get, you know, and, and who's the parent and who's not the parent. And so I'm just wondering how reasoning deals with power. You know, how do you think about the application or the sort of um, ecological context under which reasoning is conducted? And then I think it also relates a little bit to the article you were mentioning because it feels like if there's some evolutionary benefit to reasoning or to, to argumentation, to sort of reasoned argumentation, whatever its flaws, it strikes me that that would have to happen in some context of some sort of some sort of egalitarian context. Because uh, if you're more powerful, physically powerful, why would you need to have a, a well-reasoned argument if if the you, you know it seems like among equals is where your reasoning matters, but those seem to be not so common, and maybe there's a certain time in our evolution in which that became more common, and, and, and that seems like that would be the place where you could imagine some sort of conferral of, of benefit in natural selection. Um, but some, I, I, I always have this trouble with the, and I should be doing more, doing more reading, but the evolutionary psychology perspective that it, they always, some of it, it, it sort of slips into just so, you know, this is why it evolved, yes, it does, it does. And, and, and that it's always and, and, tricky. And that's the bad stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so anyway, so I, I'm curious about sort of how does, you know, is is the sort of relational context or the power, how does that play into how you think about everyday reasoning? Because it seems like everyday reasoning is happening in that kind of context. Okay, so Emily, I think your question starts here and then it moves over to Wendelin. So I'm gonna, <laughs> okay. I'm gonna answer the part. <laughs> uh, the power part, that's a, that's a very interesting case. Um, I would classify it under reasoning about the strength of reasons, which is, my example wasn't very good. It's a, it's a very sophisticated thing to do. So take, take a, a court um, that's constrained by another court and, or, or a judge that's constrained by some other judge's opinion and the judge recognizes the constraint but doesn't agree with the reasoning that the other judge used to get to that opinion, that happens all the time. That's a very frequent phenomenon. So you get a very, you get a very complex view of the, of the strength of the reason that is given to you. You, you, you say, I, re I recognize the authority of that person to give me a reason, although I think they're a moron for arriving at this decision, yet this is what I'm going to do. So, and, and the parent case, you know, you can, because I'm your mother, <laughs> That's always a that's always the end the argument decision because I said so. Um, so I think it's I think it's always I think it's a reasoning about the strength of reasons. I, I think can vary from context to context. It's very sophisticated, and there are other issues involved. I once was trying to explain this to some um, people, and somebody somebody raised his hand and said something that just made me think. Oh my God, it's so it's so hopeless. He said. Um, does it open up a whole new level of complexity for me? And he said, well, sometimes in these discussions, what's important is not so much what you say, but when you say it. Um, so think of a faculty meeting. Um, so there, there's that kind of stuff too. That, that gives a statement a certain level of authority, which is very hard to get at. Evolutionary psychology goes over there. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to um, provide a, a, a justification or so um, of the field. The, the thing is, um, in, in any field, you will find good and bad research. And I think in evolutionary psychology, you will find a little bit more bad stuff. But you also find a lot of good stuff. And you just have to use your judgment in order to differentiate between the two. It's as simple as that. <laughs> um, but I think there's, a, a, there's an interesting line of research which really supports what you're saying. Um, I mean, one thing um, we, we know from um, paleoanthropology is that, I mean, the, the story of the evolution of modern humans is in part one of a species losing these strong intersexual dominance hierarchies, which you find among all the other apes. 
I mean, gorillas and orangutans, uh, the, the males, the dominant males, they even have these physiological signs, the silverbacks and, and these, these um, chins of the orangutans, which show um, like physiologically to, to other individuals who the boss is. And um, you, you just have a lot of evidence that the, 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 the lineage which led to humans um, um, lost many of these traits rather early on, and we became much more peaceful than other apes. And um, also the, the intrasexual dominance hierarchies just became lower and lower. And now you have this, this amazing species with um, like, biological correlates of um, paternal investment, for instance, which you do not really have in other apes, which is really interesting. And I mean, part of this pacification process is that it opens up for more complex negotiations of power. And this is something which has been studied in a lot of um, cultures around the world um, and w which you find systematically, like you, you find that cultures all over the world question their leaders and that the position of um, the stability of the leadership position is just much uh, less available than in other species. And that's partly because humans are able to talk to each other and use this talk in order to, um, to gang up on some leader they don't, do not like. And yeah, so I, I think that there's an interesting story for you there. I, I kind of I want to transfer the um, um, the field of discussion from normative and uh, evolutionary fields to um, uh, to basically to the field of ontogenetic uh, ontogenetic development, the, the basically the span of an individual's life, and um, I can't I can't really agree that. Um, our reasoning stays the same, I guess, at the moment we're born. Our reasoning just is, is what it is. It's a given. And it doesn't change, and it, in particular, it doesn't improve. Uh, and not just talking about formal educational practices, which are you know, um, notoriously ineffective, but uh, um, uh, developmental psychologists certainly think, and this is the Dominant, dominant theory in the field that a lot of our common sense notions, I mean, talking about physical notions like gravity, talking about uh, physical notions like conservation of, of, of matter and going to uh, beliefs and knowledge and what's in the mind, all of these are created through process of reasoning and justification. Uh, basically, naive testing of theories, and again, like this is not the alternative, not the only alternative in the field, but certainly the dominant uh, of what most developmental psychologists subscribe to. So, I basically wanted to ask both of you um, whether or not you uh, whether or not you agree um, about how development happens. What makes us better decision makers over the course of lifespan? I don't know. I don't have an answer to that. I'm not qualified to answer that. Uh, I'll tell you what my theory says. <laughs> more knowledge, more, more rules, more subtle rules, more subtly interconnected rules coming from experience and so on. Um, now, how you realize when you need to modify rules, that's a question I'm really interested in. So you're, you've, why do you add junk to your to your system. Why not just run with what you have? But uh, 